stand to our feet and praise Jesus together. Come on. Put your hands together. Yeah, 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 yeah. Let's worship the Lord. There's a lot of talk going round town. I hear a lot of people running their mouth. Every word like an anchor just bringing them down, down, down. We were looking for the silver lining. Something to hold on to when home's been hiding. I know a place you can go if you want to find it. This is the good news. If you're breathing, it's for you. An empty grave, a life that's changed It all points to Jesus' name If you've been searching And nothing's been working I've got good news Jesus loves you your eyes and look around this is the place where your freedom is found take it in bake it in let the world turn upside down this is the good news if you're breathing this is for each and every single one of you empty grave a life that's changed it all points to jesus name if you've been searching and nothing is working guess what i've got good news i've got good news let's shout it out jesus everybody clap your hands yeah yeah he loves you he'll never leave nor forsake you hey. no matter what you Always in love with you, no matter your history. Always in love with you.
to adore you. Ooh. Come on, every voice, lift this up today. We sing to 
your voice. He's worthy in this room. If you have breath in your lungs, you better give him praise. Come on, thank him for who he is. Thank him for what he's done. Come on, a little longer. Come on. You're worthy of our praise. You're worthy of our adoration. You're worthy, Lord. We're, you're worthy. You're worthy. We worship you. It's so good to be in a room reminded that he's worthy. We forget. Life gets hard. We get distracted, right? We need to be in the room with brothers and sisters. We need to be watching online and be reminded this is the savior of the world that we're worshiping. This is the God of the universe who puts breath in our lungs. And that's why we just sang, as long as I'm still breathing, you will get my worship. I was worshiping here on the front row and I felt the Holy Spirit so clearly remind me. We worship anything that we put above ourselves. You could worship a spouse, you could worship your kids, you could worship a celebrity, you could worship another thing. We choose to worship Jesus. We choose to put him as first, highest, and most. And then we give him that adoration. You tracking with me? Amen. We're gonna take a time to remember what Jesus did on the cross through communion. So there's a cup on your seat. If you're at home, get a cracker, get some juice. The scriptures say that we need to do this regularly to remind ourselves to remember what Jesus did. And if you're not aware, today is Palm Sunday, which marks the week of Passion Week before Jesus goes to the cross. It is vital that we pause and we remember what Jesus did and why we follow him. I want to read the scripture out of Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. It says, since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself, Jesus, likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil. This is one scripture taken out of basically a sermon that's written in the New Testament. And what they're saying is that Jesus willingly came down from heaven, put on flesh, came and partook of the same things you and I go through. And he willingly laid his life down so that he could have power over death and the devil. I don't know about you, but I'm so thankful I serve a God who has the power over death and the grave and the devil. You guys aren't excited, but you're going to be as we keep going. We get in this atmosphere and we need to be reminded how frail, how fragile, how, how lowly we are, but we serve a God who says, death doesn't have to be your final. Heaven is eternal life, living forever. That better make you stomp your feet, clap your hands, get a little excited. We're gonna take uh, the elements here and the wafer, I want you to hold it in your hands. Think how fragile this is. Hold this and let this be a reminder to us of Jesus coming to earth. Lord, this wafer I could just snap with very little effort. And it reminds me that you willingly came from your throne in heaven into a fragile body that could experience sickness and hunger and a beating. Jesus, you took 39 lashes for our sin. You experienced great physical pain and anguish on our behalf. And this wafer is a reminder that you came to willingly be fragile in this human body to partake of the same things that we do so that you could ultimately give yourself up as a sacrifice. And we're grateful. We're grateful. Thank you, Jesus. You can eat the wafer. Now I want us to take the juice in our hand, this little cup. And I want us to hold it. And Holy Spirit, would you reveal the symbolism of this? Only you can reveal it to our hearts. My words, whether they are eloquent or failing, could never reveal how precious this is to have our sins forgiven. Scriptures say, though your sins be like scarlet, a deep red, a red that doesn't just come out, it's a stain that is not removed, but your blood covers it and makes it white as snow. It is a supernatural work 
that only you could do by your perfection and your surrender and your love. And so as we hold this precious symbol of your blood over us, let it move us. God, let it humble us. Let it evoke great gratitude for you, Jesus. Thank you for forgiveness for my sin, even today. (laughs) But this covers past, present, and future. As a church, we extend our gratitude and our worship. We exalt you higher than ourselves, and we adore you for what you've already done through your sacrifice on the cross. You could drink this juice. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You can um, put this under your seat and let's continue to worship together with all we have.
your praise. We bless your name, Jesus. We bless your name, Jesus. There is nobody like you. Jesus, we love you. Jesus, we exalt your name together today. We magnify your name. There is nobody like you in heaven or on earth, none more beautiful, none more worthy, none more holy. And that's why we praise you. That's why we give all of our worship to you, Jesus, because you deserve it all. Every breath from our lungs, you deserve it all. We love you, Jesus. We pray that you would speak to us today through your Holy Spirit as only you can do. We are excited to meet with you in a new way, to see you move in a new way today. And we pray all of these things in the mighty name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen, amen. Come on, come on. Let's give a praise one more time today. Welcome to the Block Church. We're so glad that you're here with us today. Before you take your seat, just take a moment and greet somebody around you. What's up, Block Church? My name is Alvin. I'm the Young Adults Pastor here. Good morning, Block Church. My name is Desiree Garrick, and I'm a part of the prayer team here. Well, and, yeah. I'm excited because it is Palm Sunday. Yes. Next week is the Super Bowl Sunday that every single one across this country is going to celebrate across churches everywhere. We're so excited to be here. I don't know if you remember, Des, like Sunday school growing up, the palm leaves and making cool arts and crafts with them. Yeah, so where I grew up from, you know, we actually put the palm trees on the doorposts. So when people come in, we used to yell, Hosanna, Hosanna. Y'all didn't do that? Oh, okay. So, like, they were doing that. My youth group was, like, sword fighting with the stuff. But still, you know what? To each their own. <laughs> so, in the same way that they welcomed Jesus into Jerusalem, we want to welcome our guests here. If you're a guest, either in person or online, we want to welcome you to the Block Church. You had so many options or places to worship, but we're so glad that Holy Spirit led you here because we have been praying for you. So, if you would like to stay connected to all that the Block Church has, has, all you need to do is take out your phones and text TBC next to 94000. There's going to be a digital connection card that'll pop up on your phone and all you need to do is fill it out so we can get to know you a little bit better. And then after service, just meet us at the next steps table and we have a gift just for you. So let's go ahead and turn our attention to the screen for our video announcements. Hey there, my name is Mariah and I'm the creative director for the Block Youth. We're entering into our final week of fasting season. This week, we'll be on a liquid fast, so we'll only be drinking liquids, no solid food, and praying for miracles, salvations, and breakthrough. As we lead into Easter, we're leaning into our theme, Jesus Paid It All, by reflecting on the question, what sin are you thankful that Jesus has paid it all for in your life? In our lobbies, we have installations where you can write your answer and pin your response onto the board. Take some time to participate after service. Check out this special message from our lead pastors. Hey Philly! My name is Joey and this is my wife Lauren and we're the lead pastors of the Block Church where we're on mission to revive every block. We want to invite you to our Easter services on March 31st. Our theme is Jesus Paid It All. And it's going to be a creative and meaningful time together. Yeah, when you come to the Block Church, you're sure to experience safe and fun kids ministry, vibrant music and worship times, and biblical preaching of God's work. Check out our service times and locations, and we'll see you on Easter Sunday. We are so excited for Easter. It's next week. It's not too late to invite, so be sure to grab and hand out all of our invite cards this week. Now, let's prepare our hearts to give. 
And as we transition to this time of receiving our tithes and offering, it always amazes me how God is able to take our resources that actually belongs to him, that he allows us to steward, and just expand it beyond anything we could ever do. It's through our generosity here at the Block Church that we're able to be a blessing for so many in this city. There's people that are coming to Christ. There's people who are being introduced to Jesus. And the Lord is just shaking up Philadelphia because of our giving. And so there's multiple ways that we can give, but the best way to give is by texting TBC Give to 94000. And you might be familiar with it, but we have our push pay option that shows up there. But now you also notice that there's two new ways that we've added to give, and that is Cash App and Venmo. It's amazing. We're excited. But guess what? If you have Cash App, some of y'all got to change your handles before you start giving through that. <laughs> right? My goodness, the, the amount of confirmation, there's a lot of head nods I saw there. <laughs> but again, like, remember that one thing that is the Lord that has given us our resources and he wants to magnify his glory in this city through us. And we give through this church. Let's bow our heads as we pray for our offering. Our Father and our God, we thank you for the opportunity to be stewards of the finances that you gave us. So, Father, as we sow these seeds back into the ground, we just pray that they will go and they will grow and they will do exactly what you have called us to do. Father, we say thank you for giving us renewed faith to be able to sow and give our tithe back to the church and to give you not just our tithe, but a liberal offering. Father, thank you that because you gave us so generously, we want to give Give back to you just as generously with the little that we have. And we thank you, Father, that you're more than able to take our little and make it into much. We give you all glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, church, hope you are having an amazing Palm Sunday so far. And I'm so glad you're here in the house of God or watching online. And next week is Easter Sunday, and we are so excited. In fact, I'd love for you, if you haven't grabbed invite cards, do that now. I'd love for you over the next week, if you haven't already, start praying over those invite cards. Make sure you are inviting and bringing people to church next week for Easter Sunday who need to hear the gospel. It is going to be our best Easter yet. I guarantee it. I'm so excited to preach God's word. And that's typically why I take the week before Easter off from preaching just to really uh, get my heart ready. So I'm, I'm back in the pulpit next week for Easter Sunday, ready to go. But that means you're in for a treat today. We've got Pastor Scott Mitchell getting ready to preach God's word. Pastor Scott leads our elder team. He also, alongside his wife, leads our marriage ministry. And so, guys, can you help me welcome Pastor Scott Mitchell? Thank you, thank you, thank you. You're too kind. We're so excited to be able to be in the house of God today. Are you excited about this week? It's going to be a great week, and today we uh, kind of tee things up before Easter next Sunday. So uh, I'm excited to be able to share God's word with you. Been praying about this message that God's laid on my heart. Um, and we want to certainly welcome again all of our locations and online for joining us today. Uh, before we get into God's word, though, let me just share that I. I have several roles as I've grown in my life and grown up in my life. I've got several titles. So I've been called Reverend Mitchell, which is really, really formal. I've been called Pastor Scott, Elder Scott. Um, I, I, I am, um, I'm honey to the lady here in the front row. I'm a dad to three adult children that I love so much. But my most favorite role right now, my most fun role right now is what you're going to see up on the screen. I am... I am pup up to two beautiful uh, grandkids, my granddaughter, uh, Mariah, and my wife is Mimi, by the way. So pup up and Mimi, and then you see my grandson who's squeezing my head like a bad pimple, and uh, he loves to do that. I'm not sure why he does that, but I let him do it every time. But the cool thing about being a grandparent, by the way, and some of you grandparents know this, is that you can feed your grandkids as much sugar as you want, and then you just send them back to their parents and say, bye, and let the parents deal with it. All right. Well, I'd like to, first of all, thank Pastor Joey and Lauren just so much for their ministry here at the block. You do not realize... 
uh, you don't realize like uh, the weight that they carry. Um, ministry as a lead pastor, as lead pastors, is a 24-7 deal. You know, they, they eat, sleep, and drink ministry. And uh, they've been such an encouragement to Lisa and I. Seven years ago, we came to the Block Church, found the Block Church through friends. And um, Pastor Joey, because I told him, I said, listen, you know, I've been a pastor for over 30 years. I said, let us settle in a little bit. But you guys all know Pastor Joey, right? I mean, he's like, he's, he's chomping at the bit to get us involved and get us connected. And I said, just give us a few months to kind of, you know, get a feel for things. But he did say to us a few months in these words, and I'll never forget it because it was, it was life-changing, life-inspiring for us. He said, Scott, Lisa, I believe that your best years of ministry are still in front of you, not behind you. And I'll tell you what, at that stage in our lives, at that season of our lives, we really needed to hear that. And I believe it's been prophetic because since he shared those words, a couple things have happened since we've been at the Block Church. One, my wife and I started a nonprofit marriage ministry. Yeah. Uh, It's called Marriage Rocks, Marriage Rocks. And then we wrote a book by the same name, published that in 2019. We've spoken at dozens of marriage conferences and retreats. We've developed a marriage ministry here at the Block Church, which we're so excited about. And we're just getting started. But we've got a marriage conference every year, which we're having one in June. So look for that in a little bit. Uh, We've got marriage block groups. And then we also trained and developed uh, marriage coaches so that you can um, online request marriage coaching. It could be pre-marriage if you're engaged, pre-engagement if you're not engaged yet, or marriage coaching if you're struggling in your marriage. And so we've got nine coaches, and we're just so thankful. Now, I got some statistics from Rosa Nieves, who is our administrator for the coaching team. Here's what we've got so far. Since we started the marriage ministry at the church, over 158 couples have requested coaching. Pretty amazing. 76 so far have completed coaching. Nine are currently in coaching and 13 couples, believe it or not, are on our waiting list because the demand is so high. So pray for us and just pray for God's provision. But let's, let's give God a hand. Yeah. Look at God. Look at God. He is so good. Um, all praise and glory go to him. So yeah, 33 years of being in pastoral ministry. But I got to tell you, I have never been more excited about any church season than I am right now about this one. What God is doing here at the Block Church, do you sense it? Do you see it? I mean, the the people that are coming to faith in Jesus, the people that are getting baptized, children being dedicated, just so many things God's doing here. But I tell you what, it would not mean a thing if 2,000 years ago, Jesus didn't ride into Jerusalem on that donkey with palm branches waving and with people shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Do you know what Hosanna means? It means save Now, they're saying the right words, but actually they didn't realize all that Jesus was coming to do. He wasn't coming to be a conquering king. He wasn't coming to overthrow Rome. He was coming to stretch out his arms and take nails in his hands and feet for you and for me. So this is the start today, Palm Sunday, of what we call Passion or Holy Week. And it's the perfect time, by the way, for us to finish up the series we've been in called This Is Your Sign. This is your sign. It's a study of the book of 2 Corinthians. You can start turning there on your Bible app or in your Bible to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 is where we're going to camp today. We're going to look at that in one moment. But of course, I got to share at least one marriage story with you. It was a couple who had been married 20 years. Their anniversary was coming up on February 14th. They were married on Valentine's Day. This is a true story. They were from Chicago. And you know what the weather's like in Chicago in February? You think it's cold here. Go to the Windy City, right? And the husband, um, you know, he was very motivated to like really celebrate 20 years, 20 years. So he decided to surprise his wife. Husbands, let me just give you a word of advice. Don't ever try to surprise your wife. It's never a good thing. It does not work out. But what he did was he said, you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to reserve a resort, right? I'm going to book a resort in South Florida, right? Warm weather. He booked the flights for Friday to come back on Monday, a nice long weekend. But of course, he hadn't run it by his wife. And he, he realized, like, I've got I've to tell her so she knows, like, how to pack and that we're, we're doing this. So he just doesn't plan something else. So he tells her. She says, oh, honey, I've got a work appointment that I cannot get out of on Friday. So you're, you can fly down Friday, but I can't get down there until Saturday morning. And he's like, oh. 
So he changes her flight. He still flies down on Friday. So he gets down there, gets to the hotel, and like any good husband, is going to, you know, communicate with his wife. He says, I'm just going to send her a quick email and uh, let her know that, you know, I'm here and everything's good. And so he writes this email, but um, he got one letter wrong, believe it or not, in her email address. Is that a problem? Yeah, 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 it is a problem. Just one letter off is a problem, men. Um, (laughs) Details matter, men. Um, And so he sent the email, but it, it didn't get kicked back. So it went somewhere. Well, guess what? It did not go to his wife back in Chicago. It went to an elderly pastor's wife in Houston, Texas, who that week had just lost her husband. He passed away and they they just had the funeral that, that day and they just got back to her home and the family all piled in and she decides, you know, she's gonna check her email. So she opens up her laptop and she looks at her email and she screams and faints on the floor. And her family's coming, her son and daughter, they're picking her up off the floor. Mom, 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 what's the matter? And they get her to her chair and all she could do, she couldn't even talk. She just pointed to the screen on her computer. So the son and daughter, look at the screen. Remember, she just lost her husband. And she reads these words. Dearest wife, I just got checked in. Everything's set for your arrival tomorrow. It gets better. P.S. It sure is hot down here. (laughs) Oh, men, men, men. Details matter. All right, today's title. This is your sign to share Jesus. Key word, now. Now. This is your sign to share Jesus Now, what I'd like you to do, though, before we get into God's word, would you just hold out your hands, close your eyes. I just want to lead us in a quick prayer. Father, may your Holy Spirit speak to our hearts. May we receive your word and may it never return empty. We know that your promise is that it won't. But God, we need maybe a shift in our hearts, a shift in our perspective so that we realize how imminent your return is. God, how much we need to share Jesus with urgency. And so may your spirit move us to that. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. All right, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 6, we read Paul as he writes, Therefore, we are always confident and know that as long as we are at home in the body, home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we live by faith, not by sight. We are confident, he says, I say, but we would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. What does Paul mean when he says, I wanna be away from the body? He's talking about death. He's talking about his soul, his spirit, leaving his body. I'd rather be away from my body. I'd rather die and be in heaven is what he's saying. Now, I don't know about you if you have a death wish like that, but, but Paul was longing for heaven. Any of you at that place yet in your life where it's like, you know, heaven, I just, I just can't wait. Some of you aren't quite there yet because you got, you got your bucket list, to be quite honest, right? We got things you still want to accomplish in this life. I had a birthday this month. I turned 59 in the month of March. No, no, no. No, no, don't make a big deal. Just cash app or Venmo would work, okay? Thank you, Alvin, for... You don't even have to change your handle for me. All right. But I got to tell you, the older I get, the older I get, the more it's like, man, Heaven, heaven sounds so good. And you know what thing is true about heaven? That when you open up God's word, whether you start in Old Testament or new, you, you're not gonna get far before you start reading about this place in descriptive detail. In the Old Testament, heaven is referred to as paradise. Doesn't it sound inviting and beautiful? And it is. Um, it's also called Abraham's bosom. Some of you have never heard that term for heaven before, but the idea is that Father Abraham, one of our, our patriarchs of our faith, welcoming home all of his kids one by one with an embrace. Like there's a reunion going on on the other side because my friends, there is. And in the New Testament, it's called the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. What's interesting about heaven is this, 67%, check out this stat, 67% of Americans believe in heaven, or they might call it the afterlife, or they may call it a better place. But it's interesting that of the 67% of Americans that believe in heaven, the majority of them also believe that they're going there. 
entitled Americans, right? <laughs> of course I deserve to go there. But also what we learn in the survey is that no one is in a hurry to get there. Why? Because, you know, we have our bucket lists, right? Things we want to experience. Now, for believers in Jesus, Paul is about to share something very profound in the next verse about what's going to happen after we die. It says, verse 10, for we must all, all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, no exceptions, so that each of us may receive what is due us for the things done while in the body, whether good or or bad. Now, Paul's talking to believers, and he, he's basically saying this judgment seat is not about whether you're getting in or, or not to heaven. It's about what kind of rewards and things are going to be uh, given to us as we get to heaven. And what he's really saying, and don't, don't miss this, folks, is that make no mistake, how we live in this life matters and will echo into eternity. Have you ever heard there's never going to be any tears in heaven? Some of you have heard that. It's wrong. No, the scriptures don't say there won't be tears in heaven. It says that in heaven, every tear will what? Be wiped away. Well, there have to be tears to be wiped away. And I believe at least initially when we're in heaven that there might be some tears. And what are those tears going to be about? I'll tell you, one of those tears might be for like, oh my goodness, Lord, I should have done more for your kingdom. I could have given up more. I could have served more. I could have, I could have shared Christ more with the people. And some of those tears might be, for the people that you love who aren't there. But God's word is true. Every tear will what? Be wiped away. Be wiped away. So what's going to last? Well, I'll tell you two things are going to last in this world that are in our world right now. Two things are going to last forever. One, God's word. And two, the souls of people. And so our goal as a church and hopefully our goal as believers is to take God's word, the truth of God's word to the souls of people that it might forever change their eternal destiny. You know, when we get to heaven, God's not going to say, oh man, let me, how, ooh, that, that car you got. Wow, that's fancy. Well, your house is so big. Wow, I'm really impressed by that. You know, or how many homes you own or what your net worth is. Jesus is not going to care about any of that. How many places around the world you were able to visit, what your golf handicap is. All right, so you're all asking right now, so what matters? So you're all asking right now, what matters? All right, just making sure I'm, we're gonna answer that question, thank you. But there's a question before that I wanna answer. And here's the question, if there is a heaven, who goes there? So if there is a heaven, who goes there? And the number one assumption of most people in our world and in our country is this. And good people go to heaven. And uh, I'm a good person. Just seems fair, right? That a good God would send good people to a good place. That there's some type of reward for trying to do what's right in this world. And of course, we at least know that we're better than, right? I'm better than, come on, how many of you are better? You know you're better than the person to your left. Don't answer that question. You might get elbowed, right? But we're all hoping, you know, we're good enough to make the cut. But here's the problem. After closer examination, and as you look at the scriptures, the argument that good people go to heaven falls apart in a hurry. And here's why. Because good is a relative term. What was good in centuries past, we don't consider good today. And what was maybe bad in centuries past, we consider good today. Let me give you an example. Um, I'm reading through Numbers and Deuteronomy in the Old Testament in my time with God in the morning right now. And it's, whew, sometimes it's a little brutal. The Israelites were like sacrificing all these animals, you know, just pouring out all this blood and throwing buckets of, of blood on this altar. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I can't believe they did this. And that was considered good, right? For the atonement, the covering of their sins, God commanded it. Today, we'd be in prison for like... Like torturing animals or killing animals, you know, abuse. But it was considered good back then. Uh, our idea of how we look at women today was totally different centuries ago. Think about this. Women, ladies, I'm sorry, you were property of your husband. Some of you may feel that today. Hopefully not. But, you know, your husband owned you. And women were so low on the totem pole, right, that their testimony even in court didn't even matter because it was a woman. I'm so thankful that, you know, today we're hopefully catching up to 
God's perspective that we are all equally valuable in his sight, men and women. Amen? I saw, heard some claps starting over there, but yeah. No, but, but another one, you know, centuries ago, slavery was considered good. If you owned slaves, that just meant you were, you were wealthy, you were well off, and that was a good thing. And today we realize like freedom is for all people. Our God-given right, even in our constitution, says that all men are created what? Equal. Man, wouldn't it be nice if we lived that way in every area of our society? Now, here's another problem with the good people go to heaven issue or theory is how good is good enough? How good is good enough? How do you know you make the cut? How, 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 you know, it's the idea is like, oh, there's this big scale in heaven, right? And, and hopefully my good outweighs my bad. But what if you get to the end of your life and you didn't even realize that you're, you're just one good work away, just one good work. And you missed it. You missed heaven because it wasn't enough. How are you ever going to know that your goodness is enough? How good do you have to be? Well, the Bible makes it clear, don't miss this, that no one is good enough. Paul, in other passages of scripture and other letters he wrote to other churches, said one, he said, there are none righteous. There's none righteous. No, not even one. And Paul, by the way, he was an ultra strict Pharisee. He was one that kept the law to the letter of the law. And he still said, for all have sinned. Every one of us have sinned and fallen short of God's glory, God's standard. Now, not only Does the Bible teach that no one's good enough? But Jesus, Jesus, don't miss this. Jesus did not teach that good people go to heaven. In fact, he raised the bar so high on what goodness was that everybody fell short again, even the Pharisees. He said, if you're angry with your brother in your heart, you've committed what? Murder in your heart towards your brother or sister. He said, man, if you look after a woman and lust after her, no, I didn't do anything physical. No, but you just, you just saw her and you lusted after her. You've committed what? Adultery or sexual sin in your heart. Man, that, that really messes my standard up, right? Of what, what is right, what is good. Wow. So we're all doomed, right? No, 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 no. Thank God. We got to answer the last question. How do we? get to heaven. If it's not by our goodness, if it's not by our works, well, 2 Corinthians 5 answers the question. The very last verse I want to go to in verse 21 says, God made him, referring to Jesus, who had how much sin? No sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Let that settle in, please. Let that settle in. God made him who had no sin. Jesus never made one mistake never hurt one person, never messed up, never sinned. But God made him sin for us that we might become his righteousness. This is called, by the way, the great exchange that we gave Jesus on that cross all of our sins, past, present, and future. And and, and of course, he was on the cross before you were even born, but he knew what you would do. He knew the mistakes you would make, the failures in your life, not measuring up. And he said, I'll take that sin on me, on that cross. And what he gave was his righteousness to each one of us. Amazing. That is the gospel, by the way, my friends. That is the good news, that none of us will ever be good enough, but Jesus was. That it's not about our good works. It's all about Jesus' one amazing work on the cross. It's not about all we've done. It's about what he did on the cross. And you know the difference between religion and Jesus? Religion's key word is do, do. And so many of you were maybe raised in, 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 a, in a church or a mindset that I got to do all these things. I got to check off all these boxes of things I, I have to do. I'm supposed to do it. If I don't do, I'm going to be guilty. I'm going to be judged. And, and not only that, I got to stay away from the bad ones. I got to make sure none of these boxes are checked off. You know, the bad sins The fact is you'll never know whether you've done enough. And that's why Jesus came because he did everything we needed him to do on that cross. Therefore, verse 17 says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, you've given your heart to Christ, you've been grafted into Christ, his body. The new creation has come. The old is gone and the new is here. For those of you that put your faith in Christ, 
trust in Christ, um, you, you've recognized like, oh my gosh, like everything has changed. My whole perspective on my life has changed. My whole attitudes and about sin and about what's right and wrong has changed. Like God is changing me from the inside out. And maybe you're like me where you might have said, I'm not the person I wanted to be at this point. I'm not the person I hoped I'd be at this point. But thank God I'm not the person I used to be at this point. Thank God that God is working on my heart and working on my life. And he gets all the credit. You know why? Because look at verse 18. All this, all this is from God. Now, in this passage, there's going to be four times he uses a word, and you can see it underlined. God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. There it is a second time that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of, once again, number four, reconciliation. We are there for Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. So my friends, don't miss this. God, through Christ, didn't just have him die on a cross so that you could be forgiven. No, no, no. That's part of it. But he wanted you to be forgiven so that you could have a relationship with him, that you could be reconciled. Forgiveness isn't enough. He wants you to know him, to love him, to have a personal and intimate relationship with him. And you can say with your brother or sister, I've forgiven you, but I don't want anything to do with you. And I realize that some relationships can get to that point where maybe there needs to be some boundaries. But let me just tell you something. Jesus didn't say, oh, I, I've forgiven you, but I'm not, I'm not gonna mess with you again. I'm not gonna care about you again. I'm not gonna put myself out again for you. No, Jesus said, I've forgiven you so that we can be reconciled. That's huge. That's huge. And it's also, by the way, uh, an example for us to want to be reconciled to our brother and sister when there's trouble in our relationship. Now understand that Jesus never forces his way into our lives. It says in Revelation that he stands at the door and what? Knocks. He knocks. The question is, are we going to be willing to open the door of our lives and our hearts to him? Now, the other thing that's really important here is that ministry, that message of reconciliation, that God didn't just save us, right, to be forgiven, but to have a relationship reconciled to him. But it's also that we might have a ministry of reconciliation, that we might partner with him in helping others come to Christ and be reconciled to him. Um, at our men's retreat, some of our men are here, um, one of the things that was shared was the Westminster Catechism of Faith where these theologians gathered together to just talk about theology. And they came up with this statement about what's called the chief end of man. In other words, why are we here? What's the greatest purpose for men and women, boys and girls, for all of us to be on this earth? What is our purpose? And they came up with this statement, to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Don't you love that? To enjoy him forever. But, but, but if you stop there, you've missed a huge part. Our purpose on earth... It's not just to glorify God and enjoy him forever, but to help others know God, glorify God, and enjoy him forever. <clears throat> so a tough question I want to hit you with today, believers in Jesus, why are you not sharing him? Why are you holding back? Why are we not sharing boldly what he has done? And the answer is these two words, fear, Fear and pride. And by the way, uh, pride is rooted in fear. And fear is rooted in pride. We don't want to look bad. We don't want to sound bad. Like, like if I share Christ, and honestly, sometimes because of the way we're living our lives, doesn't show that Christ is alive in us. So like, I'm going to be called a hypocrite. So yeah, yeah, there's a little. Mm. But really, fear and pride will keep us from sharing Christ. You know, we don't want to be called crazy, do we? And if you've been called crazy for sharing the gospel with family or friends, like you're out of your mind. Like you're giving your life to this. Every Sunday you go to church and you're giving how much money to, 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 to God? Really? Well, Paul knew a little bit about that. Look at verse 13 of 2 Corinthians 5. It says, if we are out of our mind, as some say, 
Some people think we're crazy for living our lives for God. If we are out of our mind, as some say, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. Verse 14, don't miss this. For Christ's love compels us, fuels us, forces us. Because we are convinced that one, one, Jesus died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all that those who should live or live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them. And here's Easter was what? Raised again. I don't know if you've been called crazy. I don't know if you've been called a fool, but I'll tell you what, that's actually motivation to continue to live for Jesus and we share Christ not out of guilt, not out of fear, and not out of judgment. I want you to share Christ out of love. The love of Christ fuels us more than anything else. And I got to tell you, if you haven't grown in your love for people, you haven't grown in your love for Jesus. Sorry, but it's the truth. When I started Bible college, I was 19 years old. And I wanted to serve God with my life. And we had to choose a, a student ministry each semester. In the first semester I was there, I chose to be a part of a, a chaplaincy team. There were about four or five of us who every Tuesday were driving down to Philadelphia um, and going to what was then called the Metropolitan Hospital. I don't know if any of you are old enough to remember the Met, but it was right in Center City. And we were kind of taught like evangelism explosion. That was kind of the thing back then of, of like questions to ask and scriptures to memorize. And I got to tell you, you know, I, I had all that head knowledge, but man, when I was there at the hospital and they're saying, okay, you're going to go into this wing where there's a lot of sick people. And in fact, we had to mask up and, and put gloves on because I didn't realize it, but it, that was, we were in the AIDS ward. I know that's how old, some of you don't remember AIDS, but that was a pandemic back then. And I remember getting ready to walk into the first room to meet the first person. The goal was just to talk to them and see if we could pray for them and maybe share Jesus. And my heart was pounding. I was like, God, I, you know, I, I'm scared. And it's like the Holy Spirit said, I'm going to be with you. Just go. And I walk into that room and uh, there was this beautiful black man, probably in his mid fifties. And uh, his name was Willie, Willie Baldwin. I still remember him. And I said, Willie, hi, my name's Scott. And I got to learn a little bit about him. He was from North Philadelphia. And I said, somewhere during the conversation, I said, Willie, not to freak you out or anything. And I said, but if you don't make it out of this hospital, if you breathe your last breath here, do you know where you're going to spend eternity? Willie shook his head, no. I said, Willie, can I just share with you like a few scriptures and things that God's taught me? He said, please. And so I shared. Well, at least God's word says for all have sinned and fallen short of his glory, his standard. You know, we're all messed up. We're all broken. And we can't fix ourselves. And I shared how Jesus came, gave up his life on a Roman cross so that we could be forgiven, so that we could have a right relationship with him and the heavenly father that loves us so much. I said, Willie, it's, it's a gift though. You have to receive it. Like somebody hands you a gift, you have to receive it. Like that door has to be opened. I said, Willie, would you like to receive Jesus today? And tears started streaming down his face. He said, yes. So I led him in a prayer called the sinner's prayer back then. It still works today, by the way. And, um, as I started praying the sinner's prayer, like with, with each line, something really weird started happening. And Willie was like, he, he was, something was happening. And I'm thinking, Lord, I'm, I'm killing this poor man. I was like, no, 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 no. He was being filled with the Holy Spirit. I'd never seen it quite like that before. And I got to tell you, the Holy Spirit was going in and some things were going out of this man. And, uh, when we finished the prayer, I, I looked up and I looked into his eyes and he was smiling. And he just said, Scott, thank you so much for coming to visit with me. And uh, I walked out of that room and I gotta tell you, I was just like, oh, I just led somebody to Jesus. I just helped somebody get reconciled to God. And I knew it had nothing to do with me because I was scared to death. But I'm telling you, I, I came back the following week 
looking for Willie. And his bed was empty. He was gone. This is your sign to share Jesus. When? Now. Two reasons why you need to share Jesus now. Number one, Jesus is coming soon. And yeah, that's great news for those of us who are believers. It's horrible news for the people that are not going to be with him. The Bible says there's some horrible times that are coming. You think sometimes things are bad now. You just wait. But the other reason why we need to share Jesus now is because we're all on the clock. We're all on the clock. You know what's true about time for all of us? One is we can't turn the clock back. We can't go back. We can't change our past. And for my generation, we don't have a DeLorean to climb into and uh, you know, press the buttons to go back and change. You know, you know what movie we're talking about, right? All right, good. Back to the Future, Michael J. Fox is helping you. The DeLorean was a time machine. And if he could go back and change something about his family history, it would, it would change everything about his current situation and his future. We can't do that. What's done is done. What's been done to you is done and what you've done is done. Trust me, I wish I could press rewind on my life sometimes and change some things, some decisions I'm not proud of, some things I should have done that I didn't, I can't. And neither can you. Thank God for Jesus and forgiveness. The other thing that's true about time is we can't create more of it. 60 seconds in a minute, 60 minutes in an hour, 24 hours in a day, seven days in a week. We all have to play by the same rules. We all get, until God calls our name, so much time on this earth. So we can't go back and change the past and we can't create more time. But what we can do, and Paul writes in Ephesians, is that we can make the most of the time we have left. Paul writes, redeem the time for the days are evil. Redeem means take full advantage of, make the most of. My friends, the one thing that you can do and I can do while we're on the clock to make the most of our time is to share what Jesus has done for you with others. And one person wrote, always preach Christ and if necessary, use words. So sometimes it's our lives that preach Christ, not just what we say. But my friends, we have another Easter coming up. And I want to remind you that there are people in your life that are on the clock. This might be their last Easter. We've got to be intentional. And I hope that um, you will, as an application of this message, take out these little invite cards that are on your seat. There's 10 of them. I counted. And what I'd like to challenge you is, and I'd like to pray about before we close this service, is that you would take five of these cards and think of five people that you know. Five people that you know. It could be family, it could be friends, it could be somebody that you work with. And then the other five need to be people that you don't know. People that God's gonna put in your path this week that need Jesus. And for you to begin to pray, God, help me to keep my eyes open. Help me to keep my ears open. Maybe it's that waitress at the restaurant that needs an invite to church. Say, hey, I don't know if you, you, you've got a place to go for Easter, but I just want to invite you to come to my church. I'll even meet you there, you know, sit with you, whatever. But don't miss an opportunity. These are just little tools to share Jesus now, now. And so I want to just pray if, as you have these cards with you. Father, I pray for the five cards that are for people that are folks know. It could be a mom, a dad, a son, a daughter, a brother, sister, who knows. But God, I pray that they would make that invite, Father, that they would share something that could be totally life-changing. Because God, the vast majority of people that come to faith in Jesus as believers, it's because somebody, somebody had an input into that. Somebody invited them. Somebody shared with them. And God, I pray for the other five cards that are, that are people we don't know, Father. It might be that waitress. It might be somebody we see at school or at work, or it might be somebody we just meet in life. And I just pray that we'd be ready to share an invite with people that we don't know. May you take them and use them, anoint these cards and anoint the invites. And more importantly, anoint us as we share. In Jesus' name. 
But now I'd love for you to all to stand as we close with one more invitation. And this invitation is for those of you who have not yet put your faith in Jesus. Don't wait till Easter. There's no guarantee you'll be here on Easter. So I wanna lead us together in a prayer of salvation. May we all pray this prayer together. And especially for those of you that have never prayed this prayer, Jesus, Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I need your forgiveness. I need a savior. I want you, Jesus, to be my savior. I'm not trusting in my goodness, but in what you've done for me. I believe you died, you were buried, and you rose again. Help me now to live for you all the days of my life. And before I pray and close, I just wanna pray for any of you specifically that just prayed that prayer for the very first time. Would you just lift up your hand so I can pray for you? We're not gonna embarrass you. I just wanna know, thank you, yes, yes, yes. Yes, thank you so much, keep those hands up, awesome. So God, I just thank you so much for those that have crossed the line of faith today. We give you all the praise.